Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, your ticket to all things college football. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? Join us as we talk college football from the national championship to college rivalries to bowl games to the Heisman Trophy to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. My name is Ryan Lee. I once again hope you're staying safe amidst the pandemic, and we have got a whole lot of things to get to here on a Saturday. We've got a lot of top matchups, including a couple of make or breakers, not only in terms of conference championships or in terms of top 25 rankings, but also in terms of potential positioning inside the college football playoff. And speaking of which, we will even take a deep dive later on into the initial top for for that and even the likelihood of that shaking up later on in the season but we're gonna get right into it and let's just start off with the picks of the week we do this every single week because without the games what really is there there's nothing without the sport there's nothing without the games but let me just start with this when things really come down to the wire it really comes down to simply put the way that certain teams can lock in to the respective circumstances. There's a specific way that things are done, especially if you ever went to school, if you ever play a sport, whatever it may be. There's a certain way things get done. And... You especially know this if you went to school and if you are a little bit of a procrastinator. Where when things come down to the wire, one of two things happen. You either cram it all in, you rush to get it done, you're just hoping you put a good enough product out on whatever medium you're using. You just want something good enough to present so that way you can't say you have nothing. And the product most likely is going to get you like a C. Maybe going to be like a 75%. But that all comes with some simple things. It comes with simple bad preparation. That comes with simple bad time management. And it all comes with simple lack of execution. Now, let's take a little deep or a look into those three things. Preparation, time management, and execution. Being able to maximize that time the way you have it, whether if it be studying or practicing or taking the time to just not only do the research, but also making sure that everything that needs to get done gets done in a timely fashion. Because the thing is about stuff like that is that a lot of times it's that old adage in business, time is money, which is not technically wrong. Time is money. In every industry, every second that gets wasted, every second that gets undervalued, you're going to lose money. Or maybe you could have been using that time to make money. In the realm of sports, however, it's not necessarily time is money, but it's time is a leg up on your opponent. Every second you spend... Doing extra preparation, whether it be film study, whether it be drills, whatever it may be, it's a leg up on the opponent. And especially in a game like college football, you're most likely going to want to have as many legs up as possible because the thing is that there's a huge unpredictability factor about what can go on here. You have to make sure that film is really on point. Being able to understand what signals teams use, what coverages they might use, the packages, the scheme. And why they work a certain way. And how to combat it. But at the same time. The entire sport of football is just one giant game of chess. You're not only trying to figure out what the other team does well. But you got to figure out things that they don't do well. You got to figure out what they might be using against you. 
and then game planning for that. So if anything, offensive coordinators might be sending in multiple schemes or might be setting up multiple packages to combat against the various different types of defensive schemes. It really depends on that preparation as well. And you can honestly space things out the absolute hardest. And you can easily prepare the most. But at the same time, if you cannot execute when you can, all that's just absolutely worthless. In almost everything that you do, no matter what industry it's in, execution is weird. In some cases, execution is just do your job. It's a thing we hear from arguably the greatest head coach in the entirety of the NFL, Bill Belichick, almost all the time. It's just do your job. The job you're tasked to do, do it. No excuses. And to be fair, he makes a point. But the thing is, is that it's not just about doing your job. It's about doing it the right way. Doing it the best way. You know, legendary hair coaches like Belichick in the NFL or you switch over to the NCAA, I guess you could say Urban Meyer or Nick Saban or anyone like that. You didn't just become so successful because their guys just did what they're told. I mean, they did, but not just because of that, but because they did it to the best of their ability. They maximized that time. They maximized that preparation. And when they do execute, they do it at the highest level possible. Being able to, whatever it may be, read their coverages or just execute the play that they're told and just simply, not just doing your job, but doing it well. You know, the thing is that any single person can technically do any single job, believe it or not. It's one thing to be, it's actually the series I see a lot on YouTube I don't watch a lot of it, but I've seen a couple here and there. It's basically where they take a ordinary person who can cook and they put them with the most expensive ingredients in the world. And then what they do is they take a chef and they put professionally trained chefs with the least valued ingredients ever. And a lot of the times the chefs can outdo the regular cooks. With worse ingredients. Almost every time. It's not about what you're given. It's about what you're able to make out of that situation. And what you're able to do from it. We hear the term Cinderella run all the time. In the NCAA basketball. Especially because the season just started up. Think about it. Every time Watch Madness comes around. What's the one thing we always ask about? Who's the Cinderella story? Who is that team who's just going to come out of nowhere? That just comes down to simple execution. And a lot of the teams that are coming up, they're really going to have to execute and really do what they have to. Because the thing is, a lot of the games that I chose for this week, there are some real things on the line amongst some of these schools. Right now, BYU, they are playing essentially to do everything they can to inch their way up. The ranking. Do I think they have a chance to bring the top four? No. But do I think that they have potential to go top ten and get Zach Wilson? Maybe a potential surprise Heisman and maybe a potential first round draft pick? Of course they can. Could they potentially have an undefeated season? Also potentially yes. You know BYU has actually won the national championship before. Except it was back in the late 80s but the thing is that they are shooting for their second ever undefeated season the question here isn't whether or not they can pull off the undefeated season because they most likely can this is school history in the making Coastal Carolina's school history is kind of on the line too the Chanticleers they have not had a single undefeated season Thus far. However the difference here is that. BYU has a much easier route to get to. Because of the fact that. Their season coming up. 
after Coastal Carolina is San Diego State, who has not been the greatest team so far. If I want to be more specific, they're three and three. And BYU most certainly has a chance to beat them. Coastal Carolina could most certainly drop two of the last three to BYU and then later to Louisiana against the Raging Cajuns. These two teams aren't really playing for much. However, the thing is they both have very similar games where they have high-flying offenses and defenses that can kind of suffocate you a little bit. 48 points to 38 points on offense favor of BYU. Same on defense, 14 to 17 are the points. For this matchup, it simply comes down to one thing. I think the matchup to look for here is going to be BYU's front seven taking on Coastal Carolina in their run game. Coastal Carolina, they run for 222 yards a game. BYU is holding teams to less than 90. If BYU can hold Coastal Carolina to anything within the ballpark of, let's say, sub-150, they have an easy shot at winning this game. Because one thing that Coastal Carolina loves to do is they love to just manipulate the clock. And at the same time, BYU can't really put anything up on offense if Coastal Carolina is going to suffocate them the whole game because Zach Wilson is going to have himself a fantastic game, especially if he can beat this Coastal Carolina secondary that's only been putting up 180 yards a game. Zach Wilson is supposed to be a Dark Horse Heisman candidate. And he's been looking really good so far. However, the big question here is not whether or not he can do it. It's the question of whether or not he can be at that level. Can Zach Wilson bury the Chanticleers to minus 11? With the line currently over under at about 61 and a half. A 31-31 game is expected. Because thing is, both of these teams, fantastic offenses and great defenses as well. However, the thing is, 11 is a lot of points. These defenses are very similar. The offensive differential is about 10, 9 points. As well as close to about 90 yards on offense. The question is whether or not there's going to be a defensive showdown, whether it's going to suffocate each other, or whether it's going to be a shootout, and both teams are just going to absolutely be flinging it all around the place. And I personally believe it's going to be latter. If there's a time for Zach Wilson to absolutely show up, it is today. How is his preparation? How is his time management? And on Saturday, we will find out how his execution is. Because if it's as tip-top as it should be, BYU is going to cover. And believe me, they will. 9-0 and will go to double-digit wins. If there's any time for the Cougars to show up, it is today. Their second-ever undefeated season on the line. Coastal Carolina, they'll have to repeat a similar fate they endured back in the early 2000s when their program just started out. A one-loss team. But with Raging Cajuns coming up, potentially a two-loss team. You know, the Big Ten's actually been a very strange conference. There have been a lot of teams who we expected to be good, who have not been. And we also have a lot of teams who are good, who we kind of expected them to be. The cream of the crop in the Big 12 kind of stays the same every year. You know, get the Ohio State, you get the Indianas, the Wisconsins. Northwestern kind of came out of nowhere a little bit. But the teams I'm really surprised by aren't really the ones that are doing well. It's the ones that are doing poorly. Particularly Penn State and Michigan. But that's for another day. We all know that Ohio State's the cream of the crop when it comes to the Big Ten. No one's passing Ohio State. The only time anyone's going to dethrone Ohio State is going to be in the Big Ten Championship game leading up to the National Championship playoff round. That's the only way that Ohio State cannot make it. However, the thing is, I think out of everyone in the Big 12, only one team has that ability. 
However, there are some big issues with said team. The team that can do it is Indiana. 5-1 and one right now. Number 12 in the country. However, there are a lot of issues with the Hoosiers right now. They have a lot of issues. They suffered a big one a couple weeks ago. They had a guy who kind of come off the gate as a potential dark horse Heisman candidate. At least who's in the discussion, who's making waves. Michael Penix. Penix went down with an ACL injury in the game versus Maryland, which they would eventually go on to win. But once again, they lost their starting quarterback, the one who was supposed to lead them to the promised land. Now, the thing is that Jack Tuttle, his backup, the one who stepped in in the Maryland game, is not thrown a lot. 5 for 5 for 31 yards so far, which is not really anything super crazy. The year before, he threw a couple snaps here and there too. 6 of 11 for 34 yards. The thing is, I cannot find very much of anything on this guy. All I was able to find is that he was a four-star recruit. It's really good. It's really hard to gauge what you're going to get. I don't think he's able to perform like the way that DJ Ayangalole really stepped in for Clemson when Trevor Lawrence went down with COVID. But at the same time, he's got to at least do something noteworthy to fill in for such a giant hole. Because the thing is, the Hoosiers offense has been outstanding at 33 points a game, 380 yards. But the thing is, Penix was averaging 280 of those yards with his arm alone. Like, Michael Penix was a large chunk of the reason why Indiana was so successful. Why they had a chance to even compete with Ohio State, who was supposed to be the best Big Ten team. Number three, number four in the country. Indiana kept up with them. But when you have a sophomore quarterback who hasn't done anything yet, who knows? Is a complete dice roll. Graham Mertz is at least going to give me something that I can physically see. But at the same time, Wisconsin is coming off that really bad 17-7 to loss to Northwestern two weeks ago. I don't know what to make of Wisconsin. I do know this. Their defense is phenomenal. 12 points against per game. Indiana, another great defense. 21 points allowed per game. Yardage-wise, they're kind of similar. 365 allowed versus 233 allowed. However, a lot of those yards came against Ohio State. I do not have any idea what to make of this game. All I know is that currently Wisconsin is favored minus three and a half. The Badgers have had a lot of games canceled lately. They've had a lot of time and they've had a lot of cancellations because of the circumstances going on around the world. It's one of those things where you have two teams in very unique situations. You don't really know how to gauge either of them or how to gauge them properly. Minus 13 and a half for Wisconsin is going to be tough. I most certainly think that Wisconsin has the potential to cover the 13 and a half. But the thing is that concerns me is that Wisconsin put up ginormous offensive numbers against some less than stellar opponents against Illinois and against Michigan. Two teams who are struggling right now. Two and four and two and three. And yeah, Indiana's put up a lot of outstanding offensive performances for themselves as well. But the thing is, is that they're all with a different quarterback. So who knows what to make of this game? But at the same time, I think if Indiana can pull something together, they can absolutely cover the spread, make it within 13. And that's what I'm going to take because we've seen a lot of success with backup quarterbacks. You know why? When backup quarterbacks have that chance in the NCAA, what do they do? They 
do not waste the opportunity. Because you're not just playing for a high caliber team. You're not just playing for some of the top football teams in the entire the NCAA. You are starting for them. And the thing is, it's not just playing for your spot on the team. It's playing to potentially create a quarterback controversy where either yourself or the other quarterback will enter the transfer pool and one of you two will start. We literally saw this just not that long ago. Jalen Hurts was performing well and then all of a sudden he performs terribly. Nick Saban, let's give it to this new kid, Tua Tungavailoa, who performs way better who is the fifth overall draft pick versus Jalen Hurts, who's in the second round, who, if it wasn't for a hip injury, could have potentially led Alabama to a national championship. He already did, but could have led him to another one. And potentially could have an outstanding NFL career for whenever Ryan Fitzpatrick retires. DJ Arianga Lele for Clemson did not waste his opportunity to start when Trevor Lawrence came down sick. He made the most out of it. He almost beat Notre Dame, a top five program in the country at the time. I believe they were number four as a true freshman. It's insane what backups can do in the NCAA game. And that's why I have all the faith in the world in Jack Tuttle. And the final game we're talking about is the SEC is a very tricky conference to gauge. I will simply preface this by saying that the SEC is tough. They are strong. They are hungry. It is loaded with good teams. And it is loaded with teams who all have potential. It is a conference full of stingy defenses with equally stingy offenses. You look at every single one of the teams in the SEC, they all have a strong defense, at least the ones up top do. Florida, Georgia, Alabama, A&M, Auburn. What do those teams all have in common? The ones at the top, they all have great defenses. If I'm mistaken, I don't think any other conference has more teams in the top 25, or at least such highly ranked teams in the top 25. The Big Ten has five teams in the top 25. However, one of them is in the top 10. The ACC's got four teams in the top 25, three of them in the top 10, and yes, two of them are in that top four, that college football playoff, which I'll get to in the next segment. However, the second you take Clemson, Notre Dame out of it, the rest of the division is really a crapshoot in the ACC. With the SEC, however, every one of the ranked teams are within the top 10, and three of them have a great shot at making the national football playoffs. Which, once again, I will get to in the next segment. But one of those teams is literally fighting for their life on Saturday. And it is Texas A&M. They got one loss. And it's to a team who is currently ranked below them. It's against the current number one team in the country, Alabama. But the thing that we need to look at is the fact that Alabama has been pretty dominant the entire season. They have such an outstanding, stout offense and a defense that can suffocate you. However, teams can put up points against Alabama. A&M put 24 of them. Alabama just happened to put up 52 that day. Auburn played in Auburn played Alabama this past week. They put up 13 points. Alabama just put up 42. Cuz Mac Jones another dark horse Heisman candidate. The 6 and 1 Aggies are number 5 in the country right now. And there's no question why Kellen Mond has put the Aggies in a great position at 32 points per game and 418 yards on offense. The defense has also absolutely been suffocating. They don't give T. 
teams a chance to run on them and slowly take chunks off the field and chunks off the clock. 87 yards on the ground. They struggle a little bit in the past, sure. But however, the Aggies, they know how to really force that on you. And back in the little little spiel I had at the beginning of the show, I kept talking about execution, execution, execution. Can the Aggies execute? If the Aggies want a shot in the top four, they have to cover this five and a half, not only, but they have to do it by a large margin. I anticipate at least two scores, maybe three, in order to really make a convincing case to dethrone either Clemson or Ohio State, and they need to have an off day. The thing I'm going to say is pay attention to some very close matchups. In this case, it is going to be a battle of quarterbacks because they're very similar. Bonex and Kalamond, they're literally one yard apart when it comes to passing yards per game. And defenses, the differential there is only a four-yard difference. These two pass defenses, the secondaries and the quarterbacks, are near identical. The actual play style is different, but statistically, it comes out the exact same. And both of them have kind of similar games, not the most amount of movement in the world, mostly pocket-oriented, but when they do go, they go at you like a battering ram. I do think the Aggies are going to edge it out with the line at 5.5 the way it is, and because of the fact that they have something to play for. Auburn's got nothing to play for. The Aggies, that top four spot, they've got everything to play for. And if trends have taught me anything, is that sometimes trends are meant to be broken. Auburn has won the last two matchups ever since Jimbo Fisher took over for AM. However, point difference was there were four and eight one score games. And I anticipate something along the lines. With a taking the win. Because if they don't. They're done. They have no other shot. At the national football playoffs. Unless they beat Bama in the SEC championship game. Those have been the picks of the week. Here on Put Your Money Where Your Mouth Is. And coming up after the break. We're going to be talking about that first set of rankings amongst the college football playoffs where each team lies, their possibility of maintaining said spots, and could one of the top four teams be pushed down? That's all coming up right after this. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. We're back here on the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Ryan Lee, back here once again. We just talked about our picks going into the week, and we've got a lot of other things to cover, including something that's going to be coming up in just a little over a month now, if I believe. So, I, if I'm not mistaken, the date is coming up very soon. The semifinals, the Sugar Bowl, and the Rose Bowl coming on New Year's Day. We've only got 26 days before that happens. And literally not that far behind the college football playoffs themselves. 10 more days after. Just under a month. January 11th. That was a fast season. I'm going to start running out of things to talk about because all these games... This season has been so interesting to talk about, at least in terms of the storylines and everything that has to change ever since this whole pandemic business happened. But nonetheless, we've got to carry on because before we even get to that, we need to go through who is most likely going to be in the Rose Bowl and the Sugar Bowl because the way that everything has been working before. And it seems like it's the way it's actually going to work again, which is that it's not necessarily based on anything that's specific to a certain team or a certain conference. There's no certain criteria. It's not like the NFL or the NBA or NHL or whatever other major sport you want to talk about where it's literally based off of record or some sort of point system that essentially kind of insinuates your record like the NHL does. And it's not like most of these other sports. You know, in hockey, you've got eight teams per conference, except we've got more than just two conferences. It's the same thing in the NFL where you've got now 14 teams per conference. But once again, there's more than one conference. And NBA is the same thing with eight per 16 total. Now, there have been a lot of rumors and chatter throughout the last several years essentially being like, expand the playoffs to eight teams. Let's do an eight-team playoff. But at the same time, I don't really see the point of it. This year, potentially, it'd be a good idea just to expand it because a lot of these teams have had very wonky seasons with all the cancellations and the postponements and all these things happening, players getting infected, coaching staffs getting infected, all that stuff. So maybe an 18 playoff would have been a good idea for this year specifically, and it would have been the time for the competition committee to experiment and they would have had a valid excuse to hold that experiment. Oh yeah, it's the coronavirus. You know, it's literally every single conference, the different schedule. Why not give a slightly expanded playoff? In this way, we can also give the people what they want and kind of shut them up a little bit and give them an 18 playoff. But no. Which is, you know, fine. Nothing crazy. So, 
essentially what's going to happen here is that it's the same format as usual. Top four teams go against each other. One and four versus two and three. And right now, across almost every poll I can find, they have essentially the exact same top seven. One through seven, almost every single team is the exact same team. Except for three. Almost across the board, Alabama is number one. Notre Dame is number two. And Florida is number six and Cincinnati is number seven. A few of the polls I have seen, Florida and Cincinnati are flipped, but there's not many of them. There's also some polls that have Clemson and Ohio State flipped. Because right now, Ohio State's sitting at three, Clemson's sitting at four. Right now, the top four teams, according to the AP, which is actually the poll that determines everything, pretty much. The rankings that you see on the screen or on the stat sheet or whatever it may be. Those are the AP rankings. However, the college football playoff rankings has Clemson ahead of Ohio State. But the AP has Ohio State ahead of Clemson. Not by much, though. Their point system they give them is simply put only about a 9-point differential, which is not very much. Essentially, what it is is they just rank all the teams from 1 to 25. The top team gets 25 points, and you go down the list, second gets 24, third gets 23, all the way down until you get to the very bottom, 25th gets one point. And, you know, you get a lot of these teams here and there with random points. Like you see kind of, you've heard me talk about teams who are like 30th and like 20-something other than 25th, like 28th or 29th. That's because according to the listings, they have a little section that's saying other teams receiving votes. They're outside the top 25, and they kind of read them off that way. And right now, essentially every single member of the Associated Press has Alabama at number one. I will agree that Alabama, almost across the board, offense and defense and special teams, has been the best team thus far. And I think a large chunk of that attributes to how tough the SEC is as a conference. Georgia is number 11, but at the time they beat them, and beat them kind of handedly, Georgia was number 3 in the country. Texas A&M, they kind of handed it to them as well, and made it very convincing. They were number 13, they're now number 5. Auburn is another top 25 team. Almost across the board, the SEC is considered the hardest division or, I guess, conference in all of the NCAA college football. And when you reign supreme in the toughest division, it can make sense why you would be the number one seat. Like, another great example of this would be Notre Dame, who's number two right now. 9-0, and currently sitting at number two. Usually an independent school, but because of the circumstances going on, they decided to pawn off Notre Dame into the ACC where their top competition was Clemson. Now, here's the thing about that game. Currently, the CFP ranking has Notre Dame at 2, Clemson at 3. The Associated Press, however, has Clemson at 4. Now, if I was... The CFP rankings. I'm not sure which matchup I'd like better. Thing is, all four of these teams are fantastic. It was very similar to last year. Where you still get Clemson. You still go Ohio State. And almost every year in the past several years, you get Alabama on the mix. Oklahoma's kind of there. They're hovering at 11. Florida's in the mix. They're at 6. A&M's at 5. And let me stick with them, actually, because I talked about them in the last segment, because I picked them to cover their spread against Auburn. Texas A&M 
essentially has to do everything perfectly in order to keep that season alive. And they just have to hope that one of those four teams slips up. But part of the reason why it was such a big blow to A&M is because of the fact that when they played Alabama, it wasn't even close. 52-24, to that is a 28-point differential. Four scores. Four scores was the difference in those. It was the fact that they didn't just win. They got dominated. The Aggies were still ranked when they played Florida, when Florida was ranked at number four. And just barely squeaked it out in what was an absolute dogfight. But at the same time, a lot of what they have to do is going to go onto the shoulders of Kellen Mond. He's had a very up and down year so far. He's essentially the only thing that can either make or break the Aggie schedule. At least that I've noted of so far. I can say the exact same thing about the Florida Gators. They lost to a and when they were only ranked 21. Florida could still be undefeated right now. Let's say, for example, Florida beat a and and they are 8-0 and instead of 7-1. and We would still be talking about Florida in the top four conversation. They would be number five, and they could potentially either break in with either Ohio State or Clemson. Because right now, it's Notre Dame and Alabama, and there's no question about it. Also, the reason why I think Florida would have a much better shot versus A&M is because Kyle Trask has been an absolute monster for the Gators. He has promoted himself into that Heisman race potentially, even though he had no business being there at the beginning of the year. Zero business being there. 71% completion percentage, 2,800 yards, 34 touchdowns. And that doesn't include the fact that the dude is an absolute tank of a man. 6'5", 240. Dude's an animal. He played solid last year. He's actually about to surpass his totals from last year. He already has lower interceptions. He already has more touchdown passes. He already has more yards. And he's been playing fewer games with a higher completion percentage as well. He's playing fewer games and he got better in every statistical category by a milestone. And Kyle Trask has put this Gators team into the discussion for not only the college football playoff, but he has also done so, putting himself in the conversation of potentially winning the Heisman. Florida is mostly well known as being a defensive team, and I do get that. But at the same time, 43 points per game on offense is absolutely monstrous. It's absolutely insane if you put it that way. If there was any team where I think outside of the top four there are more teams that can potentially make it in it'd be this year. Cincinnati, for example, they're very physical. They can play both physical and they can play a little finesse in there as well, but they're mostly a physical team. Especially with the way that the winter can be in the in the Midwest or the Northeast, whatever you want to call it in that area. Whatever you claim Ohio to be, Ohio winters are brutal. I would know I'm from New York. Being a physical presence in A division in the location you're in is a massive benefit. The coaches poll actually also has Clemson number three, but Florida at five. They actually have Florida beating out A&M by one point. One point. Which means they essentially think that A&M and Florida are virtually interchangeable. Ohio State is one of those teams who, yes, they can absolutely push you around, But at the same time, they've led a lot of really close games. Yes, Ohio State's number four, and they're at 4-0, and they've absolutely been dominant so far this year. But at the same time, I've been hearing a lot of skepticism about whether or not Ohio State's schedule was just easy. Essentially, the question was, is Ohio State's schedule just a cakewalk? Well, I wouldn't hold it against those doubters. Nebraska, 1-4. Penn State, 1-5. Rutgers, 2-4. The only test they've had so far is Indiana, who's 5-1, and one, but also they lost their main quarterback. So if they play in the Big Ten Championship, Ohio State might run away with it. 
And then you got Michigan State, who's two and three, and also U of M, who's two and four. They played all losing teams except for Indiana. And let's even include the two games that got canceled. Maryland is two and two, and Illinois is two and three. I personally am not saying that Ohio State is overrated. I am not saying that they got saved by an easy schedule. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that those who doubt Ohio State, and I have heard reports of people essentially doubting Ohio State, they make a point. But I don't think it's that valid. Because if it was just the cakewalk schedule, then Ohio State would be beating some of these losing teams by maybe one score, maybe two at most. At most, 14 points they'd be winning by. But no, they're winning by insane margins. 35-point differential. 13-point differential. 22-point differential. And 7 versus Indiana. I honestly thought about picking Michigan State versus Ohio State as my matchup of the week, one of them. But at the same time, with the way that Ohio State's been playing... Whatever line they put up would just make sense. Whether if it's 30 or 20 or 10 or whatever it may be. The line would have just made sense to me. I would have taken the over no matter what. Michigan State, they're a mixed bag. Who even knows? Clemson, however, sitting at top high at 3. Number 4 in the AP poll. Number 3 in the CFP poll. Now, Clemson's an interesting team. Yes, they're 7-1. and one. And yes, they've been pretty much dominant the entire year so far. But at the same time, when you look at the way they've handled these opponents and the way they've manhandled a lot of these teams and the way that they've won, there's no other place you can put them except for in that top four. Clemson's just been way too good to be anywhere other than lower than four. I remember last year, I was watching the... Clemson Ohio State semifinal game. Great game, by the way. Fantastic game. That Fiesta Bowl was craziness. And one of the things I remember specifically was that Ohio State could have actually come back with seconds on the clock. It's just a bad read by Justin Fields. It was just a miscom by Justin Fields. He thought the receivers going in. Receiver went out. So I would love to see Ohio State and Clemson battle it out again. Any combination of this four will make a great game. Even if it's like Notre Dame versus Clemson part three. Because you got the ACC championship and then somehow they both make it to the Nationals. It would be fantastic to watch. The crazy thing too is I'm I can make a case that in this ranking, you've got the top four coaches in the entirety of the NCAA facing off against each other. Or at least four of the top five. Because Lincoln Riley has done some exceptional things so far, but he also has a freshman at quarterback. And once Spencer Rattler develops by his sophomore or maybe his junior year, He's going to be a stud, and Oklahoma's going to get back into the mix. This was a down year for Oklahoma. They're going to bounce back again next year. Because if you look back in the past several years, it's been mostly the same teams. So what I decided to do is I went back into the past five years, and I took a look into who were the teams that didn't just make the playoffs, but who made it to the finals And who won it all? Notre Dame made it in 2019. Washington made it in 2017. Michigan made it in 2016. Florida State made it in 2015. Oregon made the finals in 2015. Georgia made the finals in 2018. LSU won it all last year. Oklahoma just made it to the playoffs in 2016, 18, 19, and 20. So four times. Ohio State won it all in 2015, but just made it to the playoffs in 2017 and last year. 
And then you've got Alabama. Made the playoffs, won it all. Made the finals, won it all. Made the finals. And then they didn't qualify last year. That was every year from 15 to 19. And then you've got one of the newest, hottest, and one of the best coaches and programs in the nation, pretty much Clemson. Made the finals in 16, won it in 17, made the playoffs in 18, won it all in 19, made the finals in 20. The point of this was to show that the CFP has been dominated by a lot of the same teams. But what do they all have in common? Coaching. An outstanding quarterback play. Joe Burrow and Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence and Tua. Jalen Hurts and Jake Fromm. Jalen Hurts and Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson and Jake Coker. Cardell Jones and Marcus Mariota. Maybe with the exception of Cardell Jones and Jake Coker, every single quarterback that was listed is either in the NFL or is about to be in the NFL. And almost every single one of them also had outstanding coaching. Urban Meyer, Mark Helfrich, who's kind of the anomaly there. And then you had Saban and Dabble Sweeney. 17, Saban and Dabble Sweeney again. 18, Saban and Kirby Smart. 19, you had Saban and Dabble Sweeney. And then last year, you had Dabo and Ed Orgeron. That coach-quarterback combo has been killer for these playoffs. And almost every single one of them has an amazing one for the teams that are left. Saban and Mac Jones. Ian Book and Brian Kelly. Dabo and Trevor Lawrence. Ryan Day and Justin Fields. I just spotted three Heisman caliber quarterbacks right there. You include Kyle Trask, who's at number six. You got four. Four within the top five teams. It's going to be a doozy, but we'll just have to wait and see. That's been it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Leave us a review and a comment. It really helps us out. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and come back here for the Wednesday show as well. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And be sure to check us out on all of your favorite social media platforms. For all of us here at the GSMC Podcast Network, this is the GSMC College Football Podcast. I'm Ryan Lee. Have a great rest of your night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From football to basketball, baseball to MMA, and even soccer. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast.